Hi everyone, we are back with a new system design video on rate limiting. Uh, specifically the problem that we are trying to solve is that of the thundering herd. So if you can imagine a huge group of bison charging towards you, crushing everything in their path, uh, that's what it feels like when you're on the server side and there's a ton of requests coming in from users. Uh, they're just going to crush your servers and crush your system completely. So to avoid this problem, uh, what we do on the server side is something called rate limiting. And let's just try to understand the scenario first. Uh, let's say you have four servers and let's say you have a request range from 1 to 400. So every server is load balanced uh, to serve a range of 100 requests. Now let us assume that you have uh, S1 crashing because for some reason maybe uh, some internal issue, S1 crashed resulting in S4, S3 and S2 taking additional load. So S1 had the range from 1 to 100 the load balance is going to be smart about this and assign them loads, let's say 1 to 1, 1 to 33. Uh, this is going to get an additional request range from 34 to 67. And this is going to get an additional range from 68 to 100. Okay, so S1 crashing did not affect the rest of the servers because, or rather did not affect the users because uh, the rest of the servers are now able to serve their requests. However, uh, there's an implicit assumption over here uh, and the assumption is that each of these servers can handle the new load. Okay, let us assume that S4 did not have that much compute power. It was barely surviving with request range of 100 and by adding to that range that it needs to serve now, S4 is completely exhausted and the requests are taking too much time, there are too many timeouts, S4 crashes. So S1 was already dead. S4 is now dead and as you can expect somebody needs to actually answer so somebody needs to um, take these requests from this range so uh, I'm going to give these additional ranges now for S4 which is 301 to 350 uh, and also the additional range over here which is uh, let's say 1 to 17 and now we have this server also serving some range 351 to 400 and 18 to 33. You're probably getting an idea now. These ranges are pretty big. Uh, initially, S3 was serving half of what it is serving right now as a request range. And there's a good chance that S3 will also crash. So if S3 crashes, it was serving 200% of the load that it could, maybe it just had 50% additional uh, and it crashes which means S2 has to serve around 400% of its original load, approximately. And there's a very good chance that S2 will also crash. Resulting in the whole system crashing, all of your users being upset, uh, and this is something that we really want to avoid. So this problem is called the cascading failure problem. And that's the first problem that we try to mitigate. As you can see, this cascading failure is a race against time. When S1 had crashed, there's that delta, that small time gap that you have for bringing in a new server before S4 takes that much load and crashes. So it is a race against time. One of the things that you could do is have a really smart load balance or have some seamless sort of new server bringing in. But we should assume the worst. And there are some possible, let's say, workarounds and one real solution to this problem. Uh, one workaround, of course, is to just stop serving requests for all users having request IDs 1 to 100. Yeah, that's, that's not really a solution. But if you see that the other services can't take in more load, it's better to be available to some users than to be available to none of the users. And now we are out of workarounds. So the real solution. What we should do is take a queue and put our requests in this queue. What's going to happen here is that every server can have a request queue uh, and they can decide on answering or not answering a request. So what I'm going to do is give each of these servers a particular capacity, right? A compute capacity. So S1 has 100 compute capacity, which for me, one unit of compute capacity means it can handle one request per second. 
So 100 requests per second, 300 requests per second, 400 requests per second, 200 requests per second. Okay, now let's say S1 crashes. Looking at the node S4, what we need to do is we need to see 300 is the maximum number of requests it can take. So this queue is going to keep expanding till it hits 300. If the 301st request comes in, what we are going to do is we are going to ignore that request. We are going to just say no. So when we return a failed response to the client, at least this server is not being overloaded. And also the client is now aware that, okay, this request failed, maybe after five minutes I should try again. So the user experience is going to be bad. Of course, this user who made that request and it failed is not going to be happy. But again, going by the principle that serving some users is better than serving no users, uh, we are going to start dumping requests. One small thing to remember here is that the client shouldn't be stupid. If the request fails and if the client is bombarding the server suddenly that answer my request, answer my request, this is going to be bad. So there are some types of errors that you can send the client. One is temporary and one is permanent, right? Uh, these are just types of errors that you can send. If you say permanent, it means that there's some serious mistake in the request you sent uh, and there's a logical error. Temporary means that you should try in some time, maybe there's some internal server issue going on, maybe the database is too slow or maybe there's too much load. So try after some time and the client can display messages accordingly. But the general idea of course is to limit the number of requests you can take on the server side so that you can handle the load till the scaling bit comes in, till you can bring in a new service. All right, so this is the first problem. The second problem that you can face is if you go viral or if there's some sort of an event, uh, let's say Black Friday, you know, sales go up on Black Friday, so might be an issue. Well, when you have an event, one of the things you can do is because you have prior knowledge, you can scale uh, beforehand. You know, if you have four servers and you assume that on Black Friday, you're going to have 50% more users, get six servers. So that's the first solution, which is pre-scale. However, if you're not very sure about the number of servers you'll need during the, during the event, one thing that you could do is auto scale. And please don't quote this video if you spend too much money auto scaling. But yeah, I mean, auto scaling is uh, something that is provided as a solution by cloud services. You know, if you, if you host your service on the cloud, you can probably ask them to auto scale your service. And you know, auto scaling is not a very bad idea usually because the increased number of traffic is probably meaning that you're going to make more money out of that traffic. So yeah, that's one solution. Um, how about if you go viral? Well, if you go viral, uh, you can just fall back to the old solution of rate limiting. So if you do uh, rate limiting, you will be stopping the maximum number of users that you can actually serve. And yeah, and of course, auto scaling and pre scaling is a good idea. But going viral is something that you can't predict. So pre scaling is not really a solution. These two are the solutions. The third problem is a real server side problem. Uh, and that is job scheduling. So often enough, we write cron jobs, which run on some point in time, I mean, we, we decide when it's going to run. But imagine a cron job which is supposed to send email notifications to all users wishing them a happy new year on the 1st of January. What could happen if you do this in a naive way is that you send all of the emails together uh, when the clock hits 1st of January. Which means that if you have a million users, you're going to send 1 million email notifications. Uh, and that's of course like a huge herd of bison coming towards you. So the way you avoid this is to break the job into smaller pieces, let's say 1 million users, so you have 1 million user IDs. The first thousand users are broken, I mean uh, the users are broken into chunks. The first thousand users are going to get the email in the first minute, the second thousand users are going to get it in the second minute, and so on and so forth. 1 million by 1000 is going to take 1000 minutes. And with this what's happening is that you have divided the work that you had on the server 
uh, into smaller chunks which it can consume you know one minute 1000 is something which is not a tremendous load so it's going to survive uh, and your users don't really care i mean if they don't get the email notification auto generated email notification at the first minute uh, of new year they don't really care so yeah it's something that you can do of course if they do care then you have to bring it down you have to bring this range down from 1000 minutes to whatever you like but you see that you can decide all right so batch processing is something that you should definitely do the fourth problem is as interesting as the other problems actually uh, it's when someone popular posts something or if a post goes like if a post becomes really popular if a lot of people are liking it sharing it uh, subscribing to it like you guys should but popular post let's say a user uh, like pewdiepie posts something on youtube then you need to send it to all of their followers if you do it in a naive way uh, the same issue of you know job scheduling will come in there's too many users and a very small uh, time delta so what you could do is batch processing over there you know send users in chunks of 1000 but something that youtube does uh, really smartly is adding jitter in which case if you have a lot of followers what's going to happen is the notifications are going to go to them in a in a batch processing way but if they start hitting the page let's say the video page then there's some content the video content which is core to youtube but there's a lot of data which actually doesn't matter if you think of it uh, that's the number of views the number of likes number of comments and so on and so forth now if you have a very popular user like pewdiepie actually posting a video the number of views are going to be changing dramatically so what you could do is to faithfully display that or you could do it in a smart way so let's say in the first hour we get 1000 views then in the second hour if there's a lot of users who are asking the number of views uh, in this video i'm going to be smart and i'm just going to say 1000 into 1 1.5 is the total number of views now so that's 1500 yeah, but maybe the total number of views in reality was 1700. So there's a mismatch between reality and what is being displayed. But we don't care because this is metadata. This is something which is not core to the video. So we are just going to display some number uh, which may or may not be true. It's an approximation. And do the users really care? Not really. They want a general idea of what's going on. Uh, and of course, this seems like a really big difference, but YouTube can be smart about this. They can figure out uh, how the views change over time uh, and if it's this is the first hour and this is the second hour instead of finding out the total number of views in this video they can just run through this graph and figure out where it should lie okay youtube must be much much smarter than this but i'm just giving you the general idea of approximation uh, instead of showing people the truth approximate and save a lot of load on your servers Potentially, this could save a lot of database queries that you're making to get the metadata of a post, right? Okay, so that's the fourth smart solution, and that is, or rather the fifth smart solution, which is approximate statistics. Apart from these solutions, of course, there's some good practices in the server side to avoid a thundering herd. Uh, the first one is the most common one, which is caching. So if you're getting a lot of common requests, then the response is going to be the same uh, and you can just cache those requests. And the, I mean, basically cache the responses for those requests. So uh, those are key value pairs. And this is going to save a lot of queries that you'll be making on the database. Uh, in turn, that will be imp improving the performance of your system and also you can handle more load then. Another thing that you can do is of course, gradual deployments. Most of the issues that people get uh, in the server side is when they're deploying their service. So there's a lot of uh, stories about, you know, site reliability engineers who are fighting deployments and the developers want to deploy more because they want to get more features out. And the reliability engineers want to stop deployments as much as they can because that makes the system more stable. So it's, it's an interesting tug of war. Uh, and what you want to do <laughs> essentially is deploy. So gradual deployments, uh, in this what happens is you don't deploy let's say uh, if you have a total of 100 servers you don't deploy them together you deploy the first 10 you have a look at what's going on 
uh, and then you deploy the next 10 and so on and so forth. Um, this won't be possible in certain scenarios when there's a breaking change, so to speak, but we are getting into too much detail uh, and <laughs> gradual deployment is a good idea. Deploy 10, 10, 10, 10 together, unless there is absolutely no choice that you have and you have to deploy in parallel. And the final point that I'm going to make, of course, is going to be controversial. Uh, it's with a star and that's called coupling. So to improve performance, sometimes what you need to do is you need to store data, which is very similar to caching. Uh, but let us assume that you have a service which for every request that it gets asks an authentication service to authenticate the user first to authenticate this request uh, and then serves the request. Let's say that this network call is too much for you. Maybe it's an external service. What you could do is you could cache the user's username and token or password or whatever you like. And now what you can do is you can see that if the username password worked uh, once in the past one hour, then maybe the password hasn't changed. And we are going to assume that this user is authenticated to make that, uh, you know, to call this service. And we are going to go ahead instead of talking to the authentication service and verifying whether it's true or not. It's good in a way that it's not, um, you know, querying the authentication service all the time. So reducing the load on the authentication service, uh, improving performance, uh, improving user experience, <laughs> except that if this is a financial system uh, and the password has changed, and if there's a, a person who's hacked into their account and they're using this password, then you're in big trouble, aren't you? So this is a double-edged sword. In fact, it seems like a really bad idea in most cases. So you should only couple systems, which is actually keeping data in the cache, sensitive data or, or important data in the cache, that should be avoided. Uh, however, if you have some data, like you know the profile picture or something, uh, you can keep that for one hour or two hours. That's why there's a star over here. Uh, you want to take this case by case and understand that keeping some data uh, for an external service in your own service, whether that's a good idea or not. Uh, and that will improve performance and in turn that will help you handle more requests. So the problem of the thundering herd will be slightly mitigated. But really this is something like a performance improvement and probably we should put another star over here, just to be sure. That's it for this discussion on the thundering herd. Uh, we often have discussions on system design. So if you want notifications for that, you can subscribe. Uh, and of course, if you have any doubts or comments on this discussion, then you can leave them in the comments below. I'll see you next time. Stuff like the views, the number of views, uh, the number of likes, the number of comments. These things are not critical to a video.